So women feel that the way that they have traditionally contributed is just not valued. So if the society values making money way more than making kids, then I want to be making money because me making kids doesn't give me any, any recognition, any validation. So why would I do that? What the society needs is to like collectively is to start valuing women's contribution. Because the moment we do, this is when women will stop competing with the men. A lot of the ways that women have been contributing has been taken for granted, but they've seen that, oh, what men do, how men contribute, they get so much validation. So I'm going to do what men do. Hey, what's up, guys? Deron here. Now I have a wild show for you. In this show, I'm going to speak with intimacy coach Magda K. We're going to talk about sex, relationships, sex parties, masculinity, femininity, culture, you name it. We really dive deep into multiple different topics in this show. If you're curious about sex parties or you want to increase the intimacy within your current relationships, then you definitely should tune in. Now, before I start the show, 90% of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. Hit that subscribe button and turn on your notification bell. If you're listening on any of the streaming networks, make sure you subscribe to us and give us a five-star review. Anyways, my name is Deron Brown, and this is the podcast of Philosophy for Life. Hey, Magda, thank you for being here. You know, for you guys watching, this is going to be a very exciting show because we're going to talk about everything ranging from relationships to sex to masculinity and femininity. And I think I have the right person on the show right now. Um, Magda, can you give a little bit about your background and um, your relate exactly what it is that you do uh, professionally to help people? Yes. So as my job title, it is an intimacy coach. And I always laugh at it because, you know, when you're somewhere, you're meeting a person, you want to, like, you know, just do some small talk and you're asking this innocent question. So what do you do? And then anytime someone asks me that, I know that, OK, that's going to be now an interesting conversation because it never ends there. So as an intimacy coach, what exactly do I do? Um, intimacy is this beautiful space between like I said, friendship and sex, because we think intimacy is often sex itself, but it's not. It's bigger than that. So it's this beautiful space of connecting on a deep level with another human being, but also with ourselves and with life. So this is the whole area that I uh, talk about and that I work with. So yes, that does include sexuality. It does include intimate relationships, but it is bigger than that. And so how did I get here? <laughs> That's such a good question because it's definitely, you know, as a kid, I didn't put it on my vision board that I want to be a sex coach when I grow up. So it, you know, I studied business. I went to a business school. Then I worked for Procter & Gamble, for Rayburn. You know, I had a good career in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but my personal story kind of pushed me to change the direction of my whole life. So I come from a household where there was not a single example of a happy relationship. Really? So I grew up extremely cynical um, when it comes to love. That means that I got into my first real relationship when I was 27. And mm -hmm. I lost that relationship because I struggled to orgasm. So he was taking it very personally. And, you know, back then I had no idea how to talk about this. So it was this, you know, mm -hmm. big issue. No one was addressing. And eventually we started growing apart and that relationship ended. So it was a big wake up call for me that mm -hmm. it's something I really need to look into. And, you know, we're talking like 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Am I correct? Maybe even more. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, if you Google Tantra, you wouldn't really find much. Like it wasn't as available as it is now. So I really... I was very committed and I started, you know, looking for people and I found the right connections. I found the right schools and I went into it initially for my own healing. But while healing myself, I discovered, you know, this beautiful path also as a teacher. And so ever since, that's what I've been doing. You said three things that stood out to me. Um, <laughs> I know for me growing up, well, first thing you spoke about intimacy then you talked about orgasms and then you went to Tantra. So I want to start off with intimacy. I know that for me, um, when I, especially when I was younger, I used to have a lot of women tell me that I came off as cold. Mm. 
-hmm. And I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. I thought, okay, I'm dating you. We're having sex. I mean, what am I not doing right? This is is intimacy. You know, I thought I was doing everything the right way. And um, it wasn't until years later, years later, until I had like really close relationships with women, did I understand close friendships with women. These are friendships. When I had really close friendships with these women, was I able to look back at my um, past relationships and see exactly what I was missing? I was like, intimacy can go as far as holding their hand, looking in their eyes, rubbing their hair, kissing them, connecting on a a more spiritual level. Um, I want to know like, and and also, yeah, for me growing up, my mother is very, um, I grew up in a hard environment. So because of that, people aren't as open, I would say. You know what I'm saying? People don't connect on a more, um, I want to say intimate level. People are really guarded. And I, my mother never hugged me growing up. So for me, I didn't, I really didn't know what I was doing wrong in my early relationships. You know, for you, when you broke out of that, you said you grew up in more of a hectic uh, household. How did that transformation look from when you went from having, um, learning, where you went to, from where you grew up as, as to who you are right now? Like, how was that transformation? In my case, it required a lot of screaming, a lot of tears. Um, I I jumped really deep, like right away. The moment I realized that this is the path that I need to go on, that what I need is sexual healing, I went very deep. And so I did certain things that, to be honest, I don't even think people need to be doing. Uh, but I did a lot of healing sessions. Um like I remember there's this one, there's this practice called a yoni massage. So basically in Tantra, um, like or like modern expressions of Tantra, we work with the genitals. So a yoni massage is basically um, a massage of the full body that later goes also inside of the vagina. So it's a very intimate practice and it can bring so many things up. So I had all of these energies of it felt like abuse, but it wasn't never a direct abuse. So I, like, I don't want people to misunderstand it uh, because we can still carry a trauma and a memory of something painful, even though it didn't actually happen directly to you. It's a bit more complex than that. But I had all of these traumas in my body. So when I was going through my process of opening up, like I remember one session of this yoni massage, I was screaming and crying for four hours. So it was intense, but it was intense because that's what I chose. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was doing a lot of work, like a few hours a day, practice after practice. Um, so in my case, it took just a few months, mm-hmm. but it's because of the intensity with which I went into this. Um, and I, you know, at this point I was living in a tantric community, which it's, it's a bit like, you know, like a different planet really. <laughs> so, but I'll tell you honestly, when I'm back home, Um, And I'm back with my family. Um, When I'm back with some of my old friends, I see it's like, you know what you said that your your, your former girlfriends were like saying you're cold and you're like, what do you want from me? That's how how it feels with them. It's like I'm missing the depth, but they have no idea what I want from them. So I have this reflection of where I also used to be. And I think a lot of people can relate to that state. Uh, But I was like all in all in. I moved to a tantric community. I was doing a few hours of practice every day. So I literally, like, I ripped myself open. Mm -hmm. So for me, the process was painful. You know, you mentioned that your first relationship was when you were 27. I'm assuming that you didn't lose your virginity at 27. (laughs) Um, How did, how, how did your, how did your relationships look like prior to being 27? And then when did you transition, transition into having open relationships because you talk about that a lot on your channel yeah. so how did, how did that look look so i'll add something here so um my mom is a difficult person and growing up with them i had really deep fears that i'm gonna be like her and i really didn't want that so i also stayed away from relationships because i was terrified that i'm gonna have the same behaviors and i would never ever want anyone to see that about me so like my tendency are um anxiously attached people pleasers so like you know we're so people with these tendencies we're like overly cautious about what will other people think about us so the Mm -hmm. idea that i could potentially behave like my mom and someone would see it i was just like no so i would rather stay away from the relationships but of course i had the need for intimacy love and connection so I, most of my young years, my 20s, I partied a lot and I drank a lot. Plus, you know, I'm Polish. So it's like 
you know, we were given vodka when you're a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I had like some hookups. I had like a very short, like a couple of months relationship in university, but I also started late. Like, like I, I was a, definitely a late bloomer. Um, and even with this relationship, to be honest, if it wasn't for my housemate who kind of like pushed me, go out with him. He's really cool. You know, I'll be so yeah. angry if you if you don't. I'm like, fine, I'll go. But I was really scared. You know, I was really scared. Um, but then this this relationship went really like fast. This guy was really into me uh, and I got to experience actually the joy of being in love and actually even more of what it's like when someone is in love with you and someone mm. prioritizes you, which is something I just didn't really experience in childhood. So that felt really good. So I'm like, OK, now I want it. But because of all the wounding um, and it's true until today, for me, when a relationship ends, it literally plays on my deepest wounds. So it takes me a while to move on. So um, I didn't really have any proper relationship after this one. And then I ended up moving into this tantric community that practiced polyamory, open relating. So it's not something that I chose. Uh, it was a little bit something I just fall into. Uh, but I will add that in this community, um, there was a lot of manipulation. Uh, it's like subtle manipulation, but there was a lot of it. And mm -hmm. one of the things was that we were told that uh, being open, it's like more conscious. If you are unable to have multiple lovers, if you get jealous about your partner having another person, that it shows that you're not very conscious, that you have to do more work. There's like sublime your energy, like do practices to sublime your energy if you're jealous. So there wasn't a lot of space for actual healing of the wounds. It was lacking this, this um, aspect. And at that time, to be honest, because I was still scared to commit at that time. So it suited me perfectly. Having multiple lovers suited me perfectly. And to be super fair, because what I needed was sexual healing. So having multiple men, multiple tantric lovers really allowed me to move through my process of healing. So I'm very grateful to the men that I that I connected with because they're all very well versed in Tantra and they knew how to hold a woman. So if I cried during sex, if like my, you know, my traumas were coming up, they held me through that. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, but yes, eventually coming out of this community, I also realized that I actually do want monogamy. I do want commitment. It's just something I think I was really scared to admit to myself. So it took me <laughs> like 30 years or more <laughs> to yeah. get there, but I finally did. So I don't practice open relating anymore. And that's not the type of, uh, type of a relationship that I want, but I am very grateful I had that experience. That's for sure. You said two things that stood out to me. It was the, um, you're, from, you're Polish. And um, also you spoke about how people use fear to manipulate people within these um, tantric communities. So first off, it's funny because um, on Tinder, I remember I used to go on Tinder and I would put myself in different locations mm -hmm. and I would get the most matches in uh, Poland. So, really? I, so oh, yeah. I actually bought, so I actually bought a book <laughs> called Learn How to Learn Polish. I actually have a Polish language book. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. this is a hard language it's a hard language <laughs> yeah it, it looks hard it looks hard i didn't get too far but um i just wanted to say that but um <laughs> the tantra community so obviously you mentioned that people they use manipulation and then from what you stated it sounds like they use fear to actually control people and to get them to stay within the um, the community was fear, was that one of the reasons why you left that community that you saw because of the manipulation and the control factor? It wasn't really necessarily as free flowing as it um, promoted itself? I'll say this. Um, the, the school, in fact, that I went to um, later almost ended up closing down because of accusations of rape. And when they were writing a story, they also contacted me uh, because they say, hey, I know that, you know, you were enga engaging with these people. Can you share your story? But I was like, look, very honestly, everything that I did, I wanted it. So I was not in a place where I ended up doing something that I didn't want to do. Now, I did look at some of the things I was told. I'm like, e no. Like, for example, what, like the, the main um, founder of the school, uh, he did tell me once that I uh, need to be sleeping with more people. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to. I don't really find anyone attractive now. And he said, that's just a karmic blockage. And if you don't push through it, nothing will change. 
So, and I'm like, and here's the thing. I'm like, yeah, that's probably true. And yet I'm not ready to do it because it feels traumatic for me to just have sex with someone if I don't want to do that. So I was kind of looking, I'm like, mm, yeah, I think I got from this place everything I needed. I am ready to move on. So it wasn't that I was angry at the place. It wasn't that like I felt that, oh, what you're doing is wrong. For me, it was like I went into that community with very clear objectives. I knew what I wanted. I took what I wanted. And when I got what I needed, I was like, okay, I'm ready to move on. I, I don't resonate with the school so much. I don't resonate with these practices. Um, you know, if you think of these communities, this like tantric conscious communities, they really do operate like a cult. And this is not in a negative way. As in like sports teams, they operate like a cult. You know, like, like it's a tribe and there are certain um, principles to creating a tribe that is successful. So absolutely, these communities work like that as well. I personally have a tendency of going into such a community, being so mesmerized by everything. But like one year, two years, I'm like, OK, I'm done and move on. I, I, I have a lot of like different chapters in my life. I like moving from one thing to another. So for me, that just personally felt like I'm ready to move on. But I know a lot of people. Uh, in fact, maybe even contrary to what you said, they stayed because they feared to leave, because they didn't know who they were without this community. Um, so I never felt it. This is why I didn't experience any trauma there. I was not abused in any way. That's just not my experience. So that's why I moved away from that. Um, what is the difference between tantric sex and like regular sex? Because I bought a few books on it. I didn't get past the first chapter because I'm lazy, but what is the difference between having regular sex and like Tantra sex from your experience? So most of us experience sex on a physical level. Now it can feel really, really good, but it's a physical experience. Tantra works with energy, which means that your energy body has sex as well. So think of it this way. Um, if you, for example, cut yourself, imagine like you cut your finger, the pain that you're feeling, the sensations you're feeling are located in that place where you cut yourself. So physical body, the sensations in the physical body are concentrated in a specific space. So when you're having sex, normal sex, your sensations are in your genital space because that's where you have friction. That's where the energy builds up. Now in Tantra, we work with energy and what is energy? Now, if you think, you know, when you're happy and when you're laughing, can you feel that happiness is located in a specific part of your body? Or do you just feel like you are happiness? Like your whole body is happy, right? So energy body feels different. Anything that is present in the energy body becomes automatically a full body experience. So when you learn to perceive energy and then activate this energy, now, when you're having sex, it's not just a physical experience, it's also an energy experience. And through that, it becomes a full body experience. So it's a bit more like you're kind of experiencing natural states of bliss and ecstasy. In some cases, you can have deep spiritual experiences as well. Um, so things that normally people would meditate for like hours and hours, days and weeks to experience those deeper states of consciousness, you can experience that through tantric lovemaking because of how much energy you're moving. And let's remember, tantra is a spiritual practice. So it's not just about having great sex. You're working with your chakras. You're working with the energy flow. So you're doing all of this in a way spiritual practice that opens your body to these deeper experiences. So sex becomes much deeper, much deeper. And I do have to say, this is one of those things in our lives when, unless you really experience this, it's hard to understand what you're missing. Yeah, I'm trying to think my way through it because I've had friends tell me like, hey, you know, when I when they have orgasms, they just, they just nut, you know? And I've told them like, man, when I have an orgasm, like my entire body goes numb, I'm tingling, I'm paralyzed for like 30 minutes. And they would tell me like, oh, man, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm not doing shit. So I'm wondering, like, <laughs> is <laughs> how how connected is Tantra to like your orgasm? Like, is there something to having full body orgasms that lets you know, like you're having like good Tantra sex or something like that? Like, what's the connection yeah. between Tantra and orgasms? Look, so I'll just say one thing. Um, 
if you think of anything in life, like nothing is black and white. There's no zero one games. It's always a spectrum. So it's not like you have okay. non-tantric sex and tantric sex, right? And it's like, it's not like it's this or that. It's again, it's a spectrum. So think of tantric sex as a much deeper sexual experience, but it doesn't have a limit. Like, so someone can have a very shallow sexual experience. Um, someone can have just semi shallow. Someone can have more depth. Someone can have even more depth. Someone else can have even more depth. There's no end, right? So it's a spectrum. So it's not like, you know, you're saying, am I having tantric sex or not? It's not a checklist, you know? Again, it's not black and white. Our logical mind loves to have a checklist and a box. It's not a box. It's a spectrum. But speaking specifically about orgasm, yes. So if you think of, well, we know how the physical body experiences an orgasm. And again, this is mostly focused in the genital space. If the sensation in the energy body is a full body sensation, then automatically your orgasm become full body experiences. And they feel differently because the physical body can have a spike and then like fast dissolution but the energy body kind of stays in this state a bit longer. Again, think if someone says a great joke and you're laughing and you're having a great time, like unless you do something drastic to snap yourself out of this, you're going to ride the wave of this happening, uh, happiness for quite a long time. So it's the same here. Like you said, you can stay in this state for 30 minutes. Your body can be shaking and like you can have these weird sensations because the energy is taking over the physical body. So absolutely, when you start having tantric sex, your pleasure changes. It changes so much. Like um, I, you know, my experience and also the people I've worked with or been with often say that you can start crying, you can start laughing, you have these contractions in your belly. All that it is, is just energy moving. And if you remain open and relaxed, then it can move because oftentimes we can get even scared. And when we feel this energy build up, we contract. And so we're blocking that full body orgasm. But if you learn that that's okay and it's beautiful, even if you feel paralyzed or if you even if you're shaking, that's a good thing. Then you can relax into it and then properly experience that. I'm wondering, like, how much of a woman's orgasm has to do with the man? Because I've been with women who couldn't have orgasms and I've been with women who had an orgasm within like seconds and then they continue to have more and more orgasms. So how much, how much of it does actually has to do with the man versus the woman? Oh, you know what? I think it's a bit of like the conversation nature versus nurture. Um, I think we can recognize that it's both. It's just to what extent. And I think this would be individual. So you'll have some women who really struggle to relax with a partner, but they have no problem relaxing on their own. So they can orgasm during masturbation, but they struggle to orgasm with a man. Um, but also the opposite is true because a man can take you deeper. Like a man can penetrate you. If you masturbate, it's not as easy. You can do dildos and other toys. But I, for example, I'm not a big fan of toys. Because for yeah. me, like, how does that compare to flesh? Like, flesh <laughs> has energy, has feeling. It's a whole different experience. So there's definitely um, a beautiful feeling when it's your lover, when it's another human being, when you feel their presence, you feel their energy, and that energy penetrates you. That cannot be compared to using a toy. So uh, if I think of myself and, and, like, personally speaking, quite a few of my closest girlfriends, um, we we love a man and probably we prefer um, the connection with a man than on your own. Uh, but I also know women who are very big on self-care practice um, and that time with themselves is actually more precious. So I think it depends, but I would say these are two different sources of pleasure. Um, I will say that in most cases, if a woman is unable to have an orgasm on her own, then she probably will not be able to have it during sex uh, with a man. Um, while it is quite common that a woman who can have an orgasm on her own will struggle with a partner. So that doesn't necessarily translate. Uh, but I would say if you're having orgasm with your man, you're probably going to have them on your own as well. So it's like, with you know, it's the same with relationships. They say you have to love yourself before you can love someone else. And it's true, but also a relationship can serve as, um, as a channel for you to learn to love yourself. So it's not like you have to have it all figured out. So it's the same here. 
a partner can offer you support that will make it easier for you. He can also make it worse because I've I've been there as well. Like I know it wasn't intentional, but like men would say or do something that would really shut me down. And that happens very often. I think men men don't fully understand how easily they can shut a woman down. So it goes both ways, I'd say. <laughs> well, yeah, a dildo, a dildo can't flip you and twist you, but a man can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talk about you said you had some bad experiences with men. What I'm wondering is like, what's the difference between good sex and bad sex? Because for a lot of young mm -hmm. men, I mean, with these smartphones, porno is readily available now. It wasn't this available when I was growing up. So a lot of people don't know like the difference between good sex and bad sex. They think that you can just penetrate, you do the act of it and it's, you know, then it's yeah. great. It's supposed to be great. How do you know, how does a person know, like what does good sex look like and feel like? So I can tell you from my perspective, and it's funny because after I moved to the tantric community and I was only with tantric lovers, and then I met this one guy who was not from this community. And I was like, oh, here's a reminder of how traditional sex looks like. So non-tantric sex or bad sex, I would say there's a few components. And I'm speaking from a female perspective. So Men who only experience orgasm with ejaculation, everything is about the cock and everything is about the ejaculation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things like, um, it's almost like, I mean, and, and I know that men are very proud of their cocks <laughs> and I think women could learn something from that, but it's like, oh, look at me, I'm so amazing. And it's like, you're the center of attention. And it's like, it, I, does it even matter that I'm here or like, you know, am I here to just praise you? So very often that's how it feels. Like men just basically feel like I'm like, she's so lucky that she gets to have sex with me because my cock is so amazing. That really doesn't feel good to a woman. And also the obsession with needing to come. So, you know, thrusting in a way that makes you feel good. So as a woman, I've experienced this. I'm not the only one, but let's say there's a certain position that feels nice to me, but a man is not crazy about it, he will not want to have it. And then if, it's, if there's a position he really likes, then it's like almost like even if I don't really love it, he's like going to try to position me to go back into this position because he likes it. So there's a lot of focus on him. And it's not reciprocated. As in like, uh, um, he, he wants me to focus on him, but he's not giving me the same focus that he wants from me. So it's like he is the star of the show. That really doesn't feel good. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about my own experiences and I've, I've definitely been that guy before. Um, I'm just I can recall having sex sessions and then like women telling me what they like and then me me doing it. But me thinking to myself, like, why are you coaching me? You messing up my rhythm. But I can see like how I was messing up, because basically when a woman's doing that, she's basically comfortable with you and she's giving you the opportunity to potentially have better sex or good sex for the both of you, you know. But I think that's just a maturity thing. I think the more mature you become as an individual, not just in your relationships, you kind of, you know, those things come a little bit more easier and naturally. I want to know about, you have a video called Sex Parties. I didn't watch the video at all, but I really wanted to get into it. Like, get like into the what party. Is, <laughs> yeah, like, what is the, um, what does, like, okay, so let's start here. How do you actually prepare for a sex party. Say I'm going to a sex party tonight. Like, how do I get prepared for that? <laughs> okay. I need to make um, a little note first. So I, when I like, yes, this video there and my experience is with tantric sex parties. It's very different than let's call those unconscious sex parties. So there is a few different rules. Uh, it's not a fuck fest. Uh, it's not like a pure orgy in these uh, spaces there is emotional support. Like it's a health space. It's almost like a workshop. So there are people who are holding space for you. If you get triggered, you have someone to talk to. Uh, you first do some practices to open up. You're being reminded about boundaries, about safety. So both physical and emotional safety. Um, and in no way do you have to have sex. Like I've been at parties where I don't know, maybe one couple had penetration, but you're interacting. You can have energy sex. You can have a lot of other intimate experiences. But it's not like everyone is literally having an intercourse. Uh, now, I did visit once or twice, like your very average um, sex club. 
And for me, like, I, I, just a friend was like, come and see. I was like, okay, well, let me compare it to what I know. Mm -hmm. And I enter and immediately a guy comes over and like touches me. I'm like, what happened to boundaries and consent? <laughs> um, so there's a massive difference between these spaces. And I really want to underline it. Uh, tantric parties, like these conscious sex parties, we often come, we call them often a play party or a temple night. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no alcohol. There's no drugs. Uh, because you want to be conscious, you want to like consciously choose what kind of behavior you're going to engage in uh, versus like your traditional sex party is going to have a lot of booze. So th there are differences. So when I talk about a conscious sex party, the preparation would be a bit different. So if you are, um, if you're going with a partner, you do want to start by having a conversation of what's okay, what's not okay. Uh, there is a beautiful tool. Uh, it's called Desires, Fears, and Boundaries. And it's literally as it sounds. You're sharing what your desires are for this night, what your boundaries, uh, sorry, what your fears are that could happen, and what your boundaries are. So it's a great conversation to have with a partner to be ready. If you're going on your own, you can sort of have this conversation with yourself um, so that you really come prepared. So I would say this is like having some clarity, I think, is really, really helpful. Um, a few other things that really help is don't go there by yourself if it's a new space, if you've never attended it. Um, well, think about it. If someone invites you to a normal party and you don't know anyone, you're probably not going to feel very comfortable. So it's still a party. And on top of it, it's a sex party. Mm -hmm. So this discomfort is going to be much stronger so go with someone and you can ask your friend and be like, hey, let's just go together. We're not going to engage with anyone. We're just going to observe, feel the space. Uh, we can always count on each other. You can have a safe word that like, hey, please stop whatever you're doing. Be with me. You can establish all of those uh, boundaries and agreements um, and have that support. Like I'd say the first time you go, like even let go of this expectation that you need to interact with someone. Like just be like, hey. Like the challenge or like the success is that I'm in that space. Because as awesome and exciting as it sounds, it is really challenging. It really challenges us to enter a space like that. Um, often for men, it's like, oh, what if no one will want me? What if I'm going to be there by myself? What if I get rejected? Um, women, it's a bit maybe easier for women in those spaces because it's always like, available for me to sit next to another woman and just chat and have just normal time. I think wow. there's pressure on men in, in that regards. Um, plus, if there's pressure, you may have issues with direction and performance. Now you have additional stress. So just go there with curiosity to see what it's like, just to be in the space. Don't expect yourself to interact with anyone, to have sex with anyone. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, that's also okay. Like we have to understand like sex brings up a lot of things. So there's no point in making this a traumatic experience. Take it slow. Make sure you're clear on what you want to experience and on what you don't want to experience because you have to also protect yourself. Wow. It's kind of interesting that you say that about men because it's not promised that you will have sex. It's not promised that a woman will want to have sex with you. And right now on the Internet, you, there's like the red pill community. And there's a lot of guys that are complaining about women because basically women don't want them. They can't get any kind of sex. And then it's like, I guess for these types of situations, there's men within those groups who also aren't as attractive to women. So they have a fear of being rejected. Um, I'm just curious for me, somebody like me, it's like I said, say I'm going to a sex party tonight. How do I dress for that? Do I dress <laughs> the same way I'm dressing now? Do I come, do I wear a thong? Do I have like my briefs on when I first come into the door? Like, how do I dress yeah. when I come into this kind of event? Look, actually the dress code, it's it's an important element of the experience and something that can make you feel more comfortable. So again, here is where women have a bit more space because in our society, you know, women have, there's like a wider range of outfits. Even if you think of like, if you go out for a fancy dinner or something, women have all the gowns, you have a suit, you have like one outfit. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit similar here. Women can have a dress, she can have um, a lingerie. There's so many outfits she can have. For a man, it's a bit more difficult, but think about that. If you are, let's say, wearing just like um, some underwear, maybe like, I don't know, and, and let's say um, a tie, like you're dressed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
it's so much easier to move into an intimate space when you're already kind of half naked versus imagine you have a shirt and pets. Then it's like physically with your outfit, you're creating more distance. So seriously, if you're going to have two guys like neutral, one is going to be already dressed for a party and one in normal clothes, the one who's more naked is going to have more interaction because mm -hmm. it communicates I'm more available. Close hide us, like being able to show more of my body. It's something that also helps me open up and drop into the specific space that I'm in. So highly recommended, highly recommended to, to, you know, and again, like I say, I know it's for many, it's a bit more difficult, but get some like cool underwear, like maybe some animal print. Um, so imagine, for example, you have an animal print underwear um, and a shirt, like open shirt, right? Looks cool. Looks cool, but you're more available. So absolutely, mm -hmm. I would say make an effort to dress up. Yeah, you look, you're more open, you're more relaxed, you look more fun, you look like you're easy to talk to, I get it. So I'm guessing if you are a guy that's trying to make a, uh, you're trying to basically make yourself see, seen at this event, be jacked, be in good shape, wear some underwear. And then also I'm wondering is like, do guys ever pop boners? Like as a guy mid conversation, go up to a girl already has an erection, it's just like trying to hold a casual conversation, but it's obvious that he's <laughs> have you ever seen that <laughs> i'm trying to think if i've seen that um oh goodness okay i don't think i have have i okay i'm so sorry i have to be honest it's like i have a blank but so i cannot really say now my experience from my experience but i will tell you a different thing um one of the things about these sexually open communities is being open so no one judges you if you have an erection um, if you're, for example, offering a massage, like just a full body massage, let's say, and someone gets aroused, you're like, okay, you're getting aroused. Like, where are you going to act on it? That's a different story. But we don't judge mm -hmm. the body for having an automatic physiological reaction. We don't. There is no judging the body for sweating. Um, in fact, when you when you work with energy, you may burp, you may fart. All of it is actually energy being released from your body. So one of the elements is like, if you're really good at this work, is like, you understand what it is. So, so you won't be judged. You won't be judged. Now, I will say there is a difference. If you come up to a woman and be like, what we discussed before, like, oh, look, I'm so cool. I have a boner. Yo, what the fuck? Eh, that's not going to be received very well. But yeah. if you just kind of like, you know, whether you are, you know, erected or not, it's just the same as whether you have a ponytail or not. It's just like your body is reacting. That's perfectly fine. So it's in no way is it a big deal. It's not like people are actually paying so much attention to it. So when you when you go to these sex parties, like say, hey, you receive an email invitation to such and such party. Do, do those parties have like rules? Like is each party different? You know, are there sex party rules? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so just by the way, I haven't been to one in, in a bit. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons also is because since I left those tantric communities, I'm not much interested in non-conscious uh, parties. But yes, there are always, always rules. Uh, but most of the, like, like some of the rules are, of course, you want to keep it uh, confidential and private. Look, in most places, these parties are illegal. So you don't want to be like talking okay. about it. Um, you also don't necessarily want to tell everyone, like, I mean, like, would you want your family or your friends or your employer to know that you were the sex party? So, you know, it's like, it's kind of like a given that you don't share, you know, it's between us. It's between the people who attended. Uh, but a lot of the rules mostly are like, hey, before you touch anyone, ask for permission. Always ask for permission first. Um, so we practice, like at the beginning, you have to practice how to say no to someone and how to react to someone who's telling you no. Um, so, so these are the rules, more, more of that to make sure it's a safe space. Um, so yeah, that's kind of do's and don'ts. Okay. So you said that obviously you're trying to keep it, this, this space is supposed to be somewhat hidden. So you have to be invited to it. Yes. What I'm wondering is, do women invite certain men to these parties or do women only invite other women? And the same thing goes for men. And the reason I'm wondering, because I would think that just me knowing men, you can have some men in this community who aren't that attractive, who aren't in that good of shape. But then a woman might think, see another guy like, oh, wow, this guy is hot. I'll invite him to this party. Mm -hmm. And that could cause like jealousy and, you know, fights. Mm -hmm. So like, how do... 
first off, have you seen any kind of jealousy within these spaces? And then also, how do like new p men get added? Is it by the women? Is it by other guys? How does it work? Okay, so let me start by saying that uh, this idea of good looking or not good looking, um, surprisingly, when you practice Tantra, that really becomes secondary. So mm -hmm. I have been to spaces with men in their 50s, maybe even older, um, very skinny and also pretty fat. Ooh. did not impact how many women were connecting with them because if they had good energy if they understood tantra and they could make a woman feel safe a woman would want to be with them and open up so like and often in fact if i think of the parties i have been to these like traditionally really good looking men with like abs and everything they were not very conscious and they couldn't feel energy so they felt too pushy mm -hmm. a lot, like i was not interested in interacting with that and a lot of women were the same you're like yeah, no, like you're, yeah, you're pretty, but energetically, you're not, you're not really good. Um, so it's really not so much about the physical look. So if anyone really wants to be in this space and you're like, oh, I'm not the most attractive man, really don't worry about that. Really don't worry about it. It's so much more about your energy, so much more how you treat a woman. Um, are you aware of boundaries? Like all of this is way more important. Again, mm -hmm. in an unconscious sex party, probably, yeah, the hot guy gets the woman. But here yeah. it's really different, different game. Now regarding the jealousy. So this is why I said that the most important preparation is this practice, desires, fears, and boundaries, and establishing agreements either with your partner or with yourself before you step into the space. Because these spaces are highly triggering, highly triggering. So imagine, for example, that there is someone I'm eyeing, I'm like, oh, he's interesting, right? And then he doesn't give me attention. And then I end up seeing him with another woman. Of course, I'm going to get triggered and jealous. So I don't even need to have a relationship with this guy. But imagine I go with my partner and let's say me and my partner, we have an agreement that we can interact with other people. But then even though we agreed it's okay, I still get jealous. Or he gets jealous because of something that I'm doing with a guy and now he's triggered and I have to stop doing what I was doing because I need to be with my partner. Um, I had an example of, I was at the party with a partner and it was really nice because he actually came in to check in with me. He's like, is it okay if I connect with this woman? Because it didn't feel right for me not to check in. I'm like, great. And then I got extremely triggered because she was like the opposite of me. Like there's 10 other women I would have absolutely zero problem if he was connecting with them. But that one, I was like, if you like her, how can you like me? Because we're totally different. So you are going to get triggered. Yes, you're going to get jealous. Yes, you're going to think like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? This is why there's a difference between these unconscious traditional sex parties and these tantric sex parties. Tantric sex parties are held. You have support. It's treated like, um, like a workshop or it's treated like a healing session. Mm -hmm. So if you go in thinking, oh, I'm not going to get jealous, this is also why, because you also asked, how can men enter these spaces? Because these spaces are curated, it's not like anyone can be there. There is a selection process. So if you, for example, you know, what we're discussing about, like the bad sexual experience, that type of a man would not be really welcome, right? If a man just goes there because he wants to fuck, you're yeah. not really you're not going to be welcome in that space. Uh, we've had people who showed up drunk. Nope you're not entering. So you have to be at a certain level of like practice and understand what it is. Um, but usually it is through invitation. Like like the these type of spaces hardly ever are just like open to public. So you need to kind of get into the community to meet the right person so they can invite you. You know, you mentioned that the guy that you went with, he was, uh, he hooked up with a woman that was the opposite of you. It reminds me of uh, Mary Shelley. She's the one, Mary Shelley is the woman who wrote the story Frankenstein. She wrote that whole novel Frankenstein. And um, her partner would go off with other women occasionally and um, get with women that were complete opposite to her. But he, ultimately he would come back home. Like, how was this woman different from you? Oh, she was, she was very young, very physically small extremely like kind of passive almost kind of like ah, 
Yes, I'm so silly. Oh. You know, this kind of energy. I'm very strong. You know, I ride a motorcycle. I go to the gym. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like a strong, fiery woman. Mm-hmm. And he's just not, suddenly he wants this really young, uh, kind of like maiden archetype, overly innocent, overly naive woman. I'm just like, really? Like, you're attracted to that? Because <laughs> if he goes with another strong woman, I'm fine, right? I mean, in yeah. that we're connecting like this. But yeah, I got really, really triggered by that one. Well, let's let's get into that because right now, it's probably not. Are you in Poland right now? Yes. So not just in Poland, around the entire world, sexual dynamics are changing. The idea of what a man is and the idea of what a woman is is changing. And my guess, um, my guess from the perspective of your um, your former partner that he that woman came off more submissive she came off more feminine if you if you listen to the internet spaces that's what they say femininity is and what it looks like and what it should be all women are made to submit but i'm wondering from your perspective as a woman what is true femininity and then also give your opinion on what is true masculinity yeah you know um i feel like we're mixing two different concepts and this is why we're struggling to come up with the good answer to this so even though we often say oh it's masculine feminine energy and we all have both so it's not about men and women the way we talk about it it is all about men and women it is all about the gender roles Uh, but these days it feels so politically incorrect if you use the term gender roles but we've always had them and they're important now the reason why they're important is because Essentially, every human being wants to feel needed. I want to feel that I add value to your life. So the gender roles define, right, like top to bottom, they define how each one of us is contributing, allowing both men and women space to feel I am needed, I am important. Like we all want to feel that. Think, for example, if you're working in a company and you feel that you're not needed, as in, whether you're there or you're not there, it doesn't make a difference to a company. Are you going to feel good there? No. So people want to feel needed, and they definitely want to feel needed in an intimate relationship. If I feel that my partner doesn't need me, that I don't actually add value, I don't contribute, I'm going to be out. So mm-hmm. with, with I think, often what we call masculine feminine, or when we say that women are too masculine or men are too feminine... Um, What we're actually saying is that we have flipped these gender roles in a way that men and women need to redefine how they can contribute. So if traditionally a man was providing through paying or, you know, offering his muscles, right? And now a woman can do it. That leaves a man thinking, okay, so how else can I be needed? And we have to find it. We have to find it because we have the need to be needed. So we're in this, you know, we're in the process of transition and any transition, any change is uncomfortable, sort of by definition. So these are uncomfortable times because men need to find how they can contribute. But, you know, if you think of um, how business works, you look at the market, you need to identify unmet needs, and then this is the need that you're going to meet with your product. You're not Mm -hmm. forcing the market to have the need if the need is not there. That's not how it works. So it's the same here. Men expecting that suddenly women will need something that they don't need. It's stupid. It just doesn't work. You have to find, okay, until now, this is how I've been meeting the needs for a woman. Now it's there's no longer desire for that. Like, you know, there are products that go off the mark of market like all the time, right? Like a Walkman. No one needed a Walkman once we had an MP3 player. So you can Mm -hmm. think that now a woman has an MP3 player, so your Walkman doesn't matter. You have to come up with a new product. So men need to redefine their own value. And I do understand it can be very frustrating because it's changed. But at the same time, if I hear a man say that he feels not needed and not important because of these things, then I'm asking, are you telling me That your only value is in lifting heavy things and paying money? Is that really how little you think of yourself? Because I can think of more ways how you can contribute. Yeah. Right? So that's for me, this is one of the conversations. Now, secondly, 
what we say masculine feminine. So um, actually, if we go deeper into tantric teachings, um, what we consider feminine is not actually feminine. And what we consider masculine is actually feminine. So we have this idea that the masculine is the one who's active, ambitious, uh, ambitious, uh, who leads a woman, etc. Right. And a woman is the one who surrenders. That's not actually true. Feminine is energy. All movement is energy. All movement is feminine. Masculine is stillness. It's the pillar. So setting goals and going for those goals, that's movement. That's movement. That is feminine. That is energy. Masculine is when you meditate. Masculine is when there's chaos in your life and you stay centered. Now notice that this is not the kind of masculinity that a lot of men embody. If a man gives into cravings, one of those cravings being sex and women. So if a man sleeps around, you're not attractive because you're off your masculine center. For a woman, what femininity is, what feminine energy actually is, is about exploration, experimenting, expansion. It's doing different things. So if today I want to be soft and I want to relax, okay, tomorrow I want to go to the gym, I go to the gym. So the movement and the change the flow, that's feminine. But if you look at Tantra, for example, and it's not just Tantra, we have goddesses. And some of those goddesses are warriors. Mm -hmm. Think of Kali, right? Kali is the angry goddess in a way. We have Durga. They're not soft and surrendered. We have wild goddesses. We yeah. have domesticated goddesses and wild because both of that is feminine. This, what we call feminine, is a gender role that women have played for many generations, but that's not what femininity is. So we've, we've mixed those things, those two terms, but they're different things. Magda, you just dropped some bars because uh, I completely, I agree with some of the things that you were saying. Like one of the things you, you mentioned about feeling needed. I was, I'm, I'm a go-getter. I've always been that way, you know, whether it was with sports, whether it was with business, whether it was with just, um, growing myself spirituality, reading books, trying to learn different things. That's just how I am. That's, you know, that's how I know I'm enjoying my life as I'm expanding. But I was with a woman before and she felt she started competing with me because of the my monetary achievements and, you know, how I was a go getter. And the way that you broke it down helped me understand her more, because in a relationship for her, she likes to feel needed by contributing financially and handling those roles. But if I'm doing that, then it makes her feel insecure. And I'm guessing that's what some men were feeling because they feel like, okay, if I don't have my wallet, she doesn't need my wallet. Why does she need me? Like she could leave me anytime she wants. Like what's, what's controlling her and keeping her here? You know, for me personally, at least in this stage of my life, the best thing that a woman can do for me is to actually just support my goals, support me, support my goals and support my growth, because I'm not going to be the same person I am today, 10 years from now. And that's, the way that I can give as well. So encourage them to go for their goals and to grow and become a their best self, basically. But um, you mentioned, yeah. uh, I love the way you also broke that down with uh, the goddesses of war. I had, I did a show in the past and um, I've been thinking, I've been questioning gender roles and masculinity, femininity as well. You know, um, and one thing that stood out to me was that if you take a look at Greek mythology, Greek mythology, they did a really good job at having gods that were also male ma, ma, male gods that were also also very masculine and feminine you got to see a variety of different types of male gods and you also had the same thing with female gods if you take a look at the greek goddesses you know you had the goddess of war i can't think of her name right now but then you also had like the really feminine the lover feminine goddess and i think that for the last two thousand years we've kind of and it is due to the patriarchy we kind of had we focus on one God and it's all one male God. And then basically women are no longer represented in these religions. They don't really talk about the feminine nature, the power of a, of a woman. They mostly talk about how women are basically there to be the um, servants of men. And that's kind of like we're in a society, we're in a transition where we're going away from that way of thinking to find rediscovery, finding something new, you know? Mm. Yeah. And if I may add to this, so, you know, when we say we want to be needed, um, notice that 
what is valuable is really what the society values. Again, this is the same as with business, right? It's like, it doesn't matter if you think your house is worth $2 million. What matters is whether the market thinks it's worth $2 million. So because women for so long have been, you know, treated like the second class citizens. And if you look at what the society values, these are things like, you know, success, meaning like um, having a high position at work, making a lot of money, having a big um, house, a car, etc. Um, so women feel that the way that they have traditionally contributed is just not valued. So if the society values making money way more than making kids, then I want to be making money because me making kids doesn't give me any, any recognition, any validation. So why would I do that? And some of the, some of the aspects I've been looking at recently that I actually find really fascinating is, um, what the society needs is to like collectively is to start valuing women's contribution because the moment we do this is when women will stop competing with the men um but even notice today like in poland it's not as bad but i think in the us like um the maternity leave for women is it like two months or something like it's it's ridiculous it's not good it's not good it's not good yeah, it's ridiculously short and so basically like um, being pregnant, giving birth and nurturing for a newborn, this is kind of considered like your side hobby. Do everything you want to do and then on the side have a baby. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So yeah. like how can we be shocked that women don't want to be doing these roles? The same taking care of the house. Look, I know plenty of women who love doing this. I actually would be very happy doing this, but not if it's being taken for granted. I get you. Right? Yes. That's the point. A lot of the ways that women have been contributing has been taken for granted, but they've seen that, oh, what men do, how men contribute, they get so much validation. So I'm going to do what men do. And this is very dangerous because we still need babies. We actually need the nurturing side of women. So as a society, we need to start valuing them again, and then more women will want to do it. Because ultimately, I want to feel needed. I want to feel important. I want to feel that I matter. But if me giving birth is considered eh, not a big deal, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's a massive deal. So I think this is also what the society needs to, and hopefully we're going to move in that direction. You make a great point. You know, I hear so many guys on the internet, they talk about how woman is feminine. You need the woman to stay home. She's the cook and clean. And I was thinking about it. I was just like, man, you know, you don't really have to worry about a woman wanting to be clean because if you're dating her, you're courting her, you can just take a look at her car or her house. If she keeps herself clean, most likely if you guys move in together, she's going to continue to keep it clean. And she would expect you to be a clean person too. You know, she doesn't want to be a servant. She's not your maid. You know what I'm saying? She's a, she's a partner. Um, it's, I love the way you just broke that down because society, we have traditionally, at least in the Western culture, we don't value we we value we we value money. We value people who are career oriented. And for the longest, men have been in those roles. So because of that, women are comparing themselves to men. I think that the one thing that we're missing from society is that we we don't give men the freedom to explore all the different realms of masculinity. We only focus on becoming a warrior or being that businessman. But a lot of Western men are suffering when it comes to knowing how to be a lover, learn, knowing how to be you know just fun and relaxed. And I think that even women, although women have more freedoms than they had in the past, I don't think women have the freedom to just be who they want to be, decide if they want to be like that warrior princess or if they want to be, you know, um, somebody that's a lot more mellow and chill. I think that these social dynamics are definitely playing a role with um, how 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 we're behaving as an individual in the culture. Uh, we're almost at the end. So I want to make sure I ask you this question. You had a video you mentioned uh taking the word pussy back. What do you mean by that? Like, what's that all about? And why did you even, yeah, what are you thinking about around that? Yeah, so um, like probably every single human on this planet um, using, I mean, you know, the words we use for our genitals, these are swear words. Now, this is in English. In Polish, for example, we don't even have proper words for, for your genitals. Like these are like medical or like some kind of weird phrases you use with kids. So if you don't have a word for something, uh, it kind of makes the thing disappear. And that's one of the ways how we've been suppressing sexuality. So of course I felt very uncomfortable saying this. And I am personally, you know, despite my work and 
talking so openly about sex, I'm actually very like uh, I'm very subtle, you know, like a polite, good girl. So you don't say certain things. So when I entered the world of Tantra, I discovered the word Yoni. So we have Lingam for the penis and Yoni for the vagina. And, you know, things like pussy, cunt, cock, dick, all of them, they're very charged, right? So we're like, yeah. we kind of don't use them because there's so much emotional baggage connected to them. But Yoni was a neutral world. Um, in fact, it, it wasn't even neutral because both Lingam and Yoni have this deep meaning. Like Lingam means a wand, a magic wand. And then Yoni means the sacred source. Like it's the origins of all creation. So it's like, wow, how beautiful is that? So I started using the word Yoni. And I think I did it for about a couple of years. And then I realized that I am hiding behind this word. Why? Because there's no emotional charge and many people don't understand it. So I can freely say Yoni because no one actually knows what I'm talking about. So I made it a point. It was my conscious point to reclaim the actual words for genitals, to feel comfortable saying cock, dick, pussy, cunt. And especially for female genitals. And, you know, I did read the book Pussy a Reclamation, which I think is great. And it also really promotes this idea. But, like, you know, pussy is amazing. Or Yoni, it's amazing, right? Yes. So, if I allow anyone to use this word as an offense, then what am I actually doing? Like, I'm allowing you to offend the most powerful part of my body. The origins of the whole creation of the universe. Like, no, you, you don't get to do that. You don't get to do it. So if you want to call me a cunt or a pussy, it'll be like, yeah, because I took this word back. Um, th this idea of taking certain words back, it's very, very, very important for me. Um, another word where I did it is God. Like when I was younger, God was so charged. It's a neutral word for me. I am not triggered by it at all. I think it's really good to look at certain words right, that trigger us because of all the added meaning and claim those words back. And what, because this is when we heal a lot, a lot of suppression, a lot of like, you know, trauma and, and the old pattern. So if you want to heal your relationship to your sexuality, reclaim these words, like feel comfortable saying balls, saying ass, all mm -hmm. of it, feel comfortable, make it natural for yourself. You know, um, I, I'm coming from a background where I had a very foul mouth, so I'm cleaning up. I'm working on cleaning up my language. Um, I definitely use those words in for in foreplay. You know, um, from my experience, it's nice to be fun and kinky every now and then. So since we're at the end of the show, I usually ask my guests this one question. Um, and you've been talking about we've been talking about so many deep, deep topics right now. So I'm pretty sure you're going to have like. Some now I'm nervous. <laughs> I want to know what is your philosophy for life? Mm. Oh, okay. This is not an easy question because I also say that this changes, right? Every few years we discover things, we evolve. Um, at the moment, for me, it's about fulfilling my potential. So... I love it that even the Bible says that not using your talents is a sin. And I've experienced, I actually have a video about this on YouTube as well, but I have experienced stagnation. It was the most painful time in my life. When you know that you can do better, you know what you're capable of and you're just stuck in life. You know this feeling when you're like begging, God, use me. We want to be used. We want to be, again, needed and contribute. It's such a powerful need. And so I think it's maybe something also, I'm 38 right now. So, you know, with age, I'm also like looking at how much have I already achieved and to what degree have I been really utilizing my gifts and my talents. Mm -hmm. And I am right now in the phase of my life where this is my focus. I want to make sure that I am fulfilling my full potential. So my philosophy for life is, like find what you're capable of, what you love doing. And I know it's not easy because the society is so loud. Like what you're saying before, you don't feel that men and women have actually space to be who they want to be. I fully agree. There's so many like uh, boxes, you know, that are thrown at us. So it requires a bit of work and it's a process to be finding these things. But we all have this instinct inside. Like, you know what you're capable of you know, 
You may not show it, you may not talk about it, but deep inside you know. And for me, what life is about is fulfilling that potential. So that is my current philosophy for life. Thank you, Magda. This was a fun show. You know, I would love to do it again. Actually, I might have to fly out to Europe. We can do it then. But um, <laughs> thank you for being here. It was a great show. And um, I'll catch you guys next time. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>